Thanks for tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. Of course, I'm sitting with my best friend Tony. What's up, buddy? What's going on, brother? I'm pretty excited about this month. Um, you know, for people that are listening in or who, anyways. Um, so for the month of October, we are dedicating this as Hairstylist Inner Health Month. Um, it's about inner health because it's about the help and it's about like you know doing the work on the inside. Um, we're gonna have lots of conversations this month about about mental health, about us uh, uh, being sober, about you know all the things that affect us um, as an industry as a whole. So I'm pretty excited to uh, to to take up this this challenging month. I'm with you, man. And and you see it all over the place. People are posting, you know, that they're, they're feeling off or they're struggling or, you know, you see all these different things where people are, are reaching out, but, you know, you don't necessarily know maybe necessarily how to, to, not, I'm not going to say help because I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the, I can't help you. Right. But, right. uh, but you know, you, you, but you see it out there and, you know, you don't know what really what to do. And I think, when we came up with this idea about having, you know, inner health uh, of October, it's just like, wow, you know what I mean? And bring that's bringing the people that do know how to maybe help or give you insight or, you know, something that's going to help you inside to, to, to get through what you're going through. Yeah. I mean, our, our joke for a long time has been like, we're not the experts. We just bring the experts in. So, 100%. You know, we're, we're, <laughs> that's the truth too. <laughs> yeah. I never, that, that's not where I want to be an expert. Uh, it, it seems Except like well, behind the chair. You are so an expert are, behind that. Well, so are you. So are you. Um, so uh, I guess when you're hearing this last month, we um, uh, refinery 29 did a, did a article, which is interesting because it was about, you know, that they're not a, they're not a, in, in, salon or they're not a trade magazine um but they did an article um called uh, trauma dumping your hairstylist wants you to stop it or something like that um and then it, within that article today's guest was quoted a few times and and she's got a very um interesting perspective on this because not only did she do hair for uh, a long time but she was uh, at, at another part in her life she was a psychotherapist so you know all, though, though that hashtag that we throw out there all the time about therapy chair chair therapy therapy about therapy like she's truly like she's truly that you know because she both has the hair and and the therapy part of it so um but, but by you bringing that up i'm gonna i'm gonna ask that question to her too because that that's interesting because you know we we've talked about hey we're therapists we're therapy you know what i mean and that's almost opening up the avenue of trauma dumping right i mean that that, that that's a fair perspective yeah, so I like to talk about that part of it too. So yeah, let's let's get in, Miss Haley Jepson. Welcome to your day off. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Absolutely. So, okay. So, how back... detect the accent? Where are you from? Oh, I'm from England. I'm from the north of England. I'm from Manchester. Awesome. You know, is Reggie from Manchester? He's I. I don't know. So somewhere up there. Yeah. Anyways, our buddy. Of course, he's Reggie. Yeah, come on. Only Reggies I know are British. <laughs> I know Reggie. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> you might know Reggie. Everybody knows Reggie. You know, I might do. Well, that was Elton John's name too, right? I think it was Reginald. It was Elton John. Anyways, we'll get we'll get sidetracked there. Okay, so so I opened it up, kind of like yeah. Give us your history a little bit as a psychotherapist, and then we'll jump into uh to your history as a hairstylist as well. And so I I retrained um as a psychotherapist after being a hairdresser for a long time and so i qualified as a transactional analysis psychotherapist so it's a sort of therapy it's like a modality and so i worked as a therapist for about five years um i ended up actually specializing in teenagers just because i like them because they're like hairdressing assistants i was good with them um but i had a private practice um for a few years I worked in a sixth form college. So it's like 16 to 19 year olds. I was like a school counselor sort of person for a while as well. And then I volunteered uh, in sort of drugs charities and stuff like that. So I have some varied experience as a psychotherapist, but yeah, I had a certain modality 
which is really interesting because TA, as we call it, TA transactional analysis, it's actually used to um, help organizations as well. It, it, it can be transferred. And I think in the end, that's how I sort of ended up using it, although that's not what I planned when I set out. So I, I'm really grateful that I trained in that one. It's served me really well. <laughs> That's that's brilliant. And then so when, at what point did you were you like, OK, I want to bring this over into the hair world, like my knowledge and my 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 therapy stuff. And I mean, the question is when and why. Um, and so I set up the resilient hairdresser, which is my business, which is totally focused on the mental health uh, of hairdressers. That's I only serve hairdressers. Uh, and I set that up in 2019. And I'd been thinking about it probably for about a year leading up to that and it really the reason that I did it was because um I was a hairdresser then I was a therapist then I went back into hairdressing but my back is terrible and I knew I wasn't going to have another 20 years standing up and so I thought I need a bit I need, I need a plan <laughs> I need a plan b uh, and one of my hairdressing clients funnily enough was a life and business coach and I used to talk it through with her when I was doing her highlights and we sort of came up with this idea because I didn't want to go back to being a psychotherapist, but I did like doing the work, but I didn't particularly want to do it full time. I found it quite a lonely job. And when I came up with the idea of bringing mental health into the hair industry, I was so thrilled with myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you lucked out as far as timing goes, because, you know, uh, you honestly, know. I think there is a real lot of luck and being in the right time, being in the right place at the right time. And I think I just saw a gap that I could fill. Um, and then the pandemic hit. And, and that was really interesting because all hairdressers were out of work staring at their phones. Uh, and I was like, how can I help, you know? And so I think that was useful for my business, you know, as awful as that is in lots of ways. The pandemic was awful and really useful to a lot of people in lots of ways as well. And so, but I set out to help busy hairdressers. And then within four months of my business launching into the world, everyone stopped working. Mm. Uh, and I had to really think on my feet of like, this isn't what I set out to do. I was, you know, wanting burnt out hairdressers and they were a different sort of stressed for a few years. Um, and so I just read the room every day on social media and thought, how can I help? Uh, but we're back to busy now. <laughs> Have you noticed like a lot of times, you know, hairdressers stress behind the chair, but they also stress out over social media, right? They, they want to, um, I don't know if it makes them insecure or they want to achieve a certain uh, standard that someone else is doing. And so that can cause some, some type of uh, mental stress. Do you kind of like handle all of it? Do you focus on all of it? Yeah. I mean, I work in lots of different ways. You know, I have courses that I run in salons and online and then I do one-to-one, -one. but I basically say, if you're a hairdresser and you're struggling, I'll talk to you. Uh, and if people come to me with something that I feel is better served by someone who's a practicing psychotherapist, I recommend them on. But I think what I really, and so to answer your question, yes, <laughs> I would certainly help someone with social media because that's often about comparing yourself to other people, or it's sometimes just about being too burnt out to focus on it, but knowing you have to and feeling bad about yourself and, you know, all that kind of thing that goes with that. So, yeah. Well, wow, that's awesome. So um, getting back to the article, um, I, I read the article. I thought it was great. I mean, uh, honestly, it, it's why we're talking today, right? Um, yeah. It's from the article. So, uh, but reading the article, they talked a lot about um, trauma dumping. And, and when we talk about trauma dumping, in it, when, it, when it relates to the article, is that it's clients coming in and kind of giving us all their grief. And then, you know, we don't, us doing that eight, 10 times a day, and then, you know, taking it home, home with us. Um, but after we, but while reading the article, it, it kind of talked about it, but it didn't really give any solution to it as far as the hairstylist's responsibility. So, um, you know, I guess, I guess the question or the conversation that I want to have is like, what is our responsibility for it? You know, how can, if we're feeling that, that, that we're being dumped on all the time and we can't handle it, like, 
I, like the question to me is like, okay, so should we learn a little bit about psychotherapy and should we do this? Should we, is there a certain boundary that we're missing? Is there a different conversation that we need to have? So, you know, let's, let's kind of explore, you know, all of that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's such an interesting conversation. I'm not sure I'm going to give you a definitive answer because one of the things I think is really interesting about this is that it's like a secret deal that people can talk to us about their problems. Do you know, like, so for example, when I was a therapist, I made an agreement with people that every hour someone could come in and they could tell me all their problems, no matter how traumatic. And as a hairdresser, I didn't sign up for that. I didn't agree to it, but it still happened. And and, and I think that's really interesting because, you know, when you go to beauty school, as you folks would call it, no one trains you and even tells you it's going to happen, but it does happen. And, and so I think it's really a difficult one to fix because I think to some degree, a lot of hairdressers like having conversations with their clients who they're building relationships with and talking. But I think what's complex and difficult is, but sometimes we don't have the capacity because something's going on in our own lives that means we just haven't got the energy to take it on and it affects us more. And so I think it's nuanced and complex. You know, I think there's a certain end of it that's normal. And I think some people are experiencing it more than others. And I think if you, uh, as you were saying, Tony, at the beginning, if you open the door to those conversations, you maybe get more of them. And I've certainly done that as a hairdresser. I kind of opened the doors to these deep conversations and the floodgates opened and I couldn't close them again. And I noticed that this started to wear me out. And when I went back into hairdressing after quitting as a psychotherapist, I did not invite those conversations mm -hmm. because I saw the bigger picture uh, and I didn't think it was my responsibility. You know, I always say this, I've been a hairdresser and I've been a psychotherapist and both are hard and I never want to do them at the same time. And I think that a lot of hairdressers feel a responsibility that they should be able to take all people's problems on. But we're only designed as humans to really have the capacity to cope with so many people in our world. But as hairdressers, we might have 200 more people in our world than the average person. And when we're listening to all their problems, it's a lot for any human to manage. And as a psychotherapist, we're really um, set up to take care of ourselves when we're listening to trauma all day. It's compulsory that we go and talk to another therapist about our clients and how they're affecting us. There's systems in place because we agreed to this. Whereas I think the thing in hairdressing is we didn't agree to it, so we haven't got any systems in place. You know, and then your other question was, should we be training hairdressers and I have really mixed feelings about that, you know. Um, I see there's charities, you know, where um, we're training hairdressers to talk to people about domestic violence. And there's a great charity in the UK that uh, is all about barbers talking to men about suicide. And I sort of think it's okay if you sign up for that. Um, but I always think we've got to think about the hairdressers that it might be triggering for or who might not have that capacity. So to just expect all hairdressers to do that training, again, I think that's a problem. They're two separate jobs and it's hard to do them both, you know? Yeah, I think, of the, I don't know if somebody legislated it or something, but like like barbers or hairstylists are supposed to like know the signs for like domestic d domestic abuse or domestic violence or something. And, and, and like, I would be all for that, but I do kind of feel like it's outside of what my job is and not, and I'm not trying to be cold or calloused or anything like that. Like, like I would be, I would definitely do it. And if I saw it, I mean, I've been fortunate enough where I haven't seen much of that kind of stuff. Um, but, um, but I, I mean, I would, I don't know. I, 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 I listen, it might just be in my, this might not even be like a domestic violence thing. It might just be like, who's going to legislate what my job is. It's probably more of that than anything. I think, I think the schools do. I mean, you know, they should have uh, how to handle it. You know what I mean? If you come across it, if you don't know how to handle it, 
you you know, not, you're either going to absorb it and take it, or you're going to, you know, maybe do something that's going to, you know, offend or, or encourage it. So, but to, to, to reckon, to teach us how to recognize it and how to handle it. If I want to dive in, or if I don't want to dive in, give me the tools to the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Give me the tools to how to handle that. I, I'm more interested in giving people the tools to signpost people to something more appropriate. Yeah. Exactly. You know? If you would have taught me how to do that, then I can do that. You know what I mean? But a lot of times we get, we're like, whoa, you know what I mean? And then we just get quiet and then we'll just sit there and, and, and listen to it or or just absorb it. Yeah. And I think another problem is some hairdressers really want to help, but don't have the skills to help. Uh, and and I have a, one of my favorite sayings is don't open boxes you can't close. <laughs> and so what that really refers to is if you've not got the skills, don't go digging into people's trauma <laughs> because you never know what's going to happen. And then you can end up making things worse. And so I think it's one thing to be clear about is what is the responsibility of a hairdresser? I think it would be great if this was a conversation that was hard and you know, it, that, that was hard um, where clients are listening as well so that people could think, oh, oh, do I use my hairdresser in that way sometime? I haven't really thought about that. You know, just that sort of thing. But I think it's, I think around mental health, it's really important to know, are you qualified? And is it your responsibility? You know, and, and I don't, sometimes people will think that that sounds really uncompassionate but it's actually very compassionate to the hairdressers for one. Um, but it's not that I have no compassion. Um, I'm just, I'm really interested in the people who do the helping that they have capacity to do it and they chose to do it and that they're okay as well. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's an important part too, because um, I, we even talked about it on another podcast is like, I, after 30 years, I've never really felt this, you know, I read the article and I was a little disconnected to it because I, I just, I, I've never felt like I take it on, you know, client to client or I take it or I take it on at the end of the week. I've never really felt that. Not that I'm not like, I understand the people doing, I see it. I see it on other people when, when they're taking, when they're taking it all on. So, um, again, I've just kind of, I was kind of disconnected from that. Cause I, I just didn't feel that, but, but by no means is my disconnection define everybody that's in the industry, but yeah. vice too, right? Like, 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 I think what you said was, you know, if you decide to do this, then, then, then this is it. But um, then, you know, I have a question for you, Corey. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, geez. <laughs> if I can ask a question as well. <laughs> can I lay down first? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I was wondering, is it that clients weren't, aren't dumping on you or is it that they are, but you're just, you have the skills to not take it on? I'm just wondering which one it is. Well, it's both, right? I mean, after 30 years, it's everything, right? Now, now at this point in my career, it's a lot different. At, at, at this point in my career, my clients are much, we're much friendlier than, 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 than before. You know, it wasn't just like, you know, your first time appointments. Now it's people, now it's people that I've seen for, you know, 25 years or something. So, you know, if they want to talk about their, their, their kids starting high school and how traumatic that is, you know, let's, let's have the conversation. Yeah. I've just never, I've never felt. And not that I'm not empathetic, because I'm I'm completely empathetic. It's not that I just don't I don't own their energy. Yeah, well, it's a bit like you know where they end and you start, <laughs> uh, and what your responsibility is, and you maybe trust that they're adults that are responsible for themselves. But there's a lot of people in our industry who are, you know, helpers by design. Do you know what I mean? Like, um. Uh, you you know in the therapy world we might call it rescuers but some of us lean towards loving helping people and we go a bit above and beyond and I think that it sounds to me like Corey you don't have that which is healthy <laughs> um, but some of us do and we all often end up in the service industry and I think we're not sure we, we it's like it's almost like we feel drawn to help people with everything as much as we can. And we're going home and worrying about people. And it's almost as, you know, as a therapist, the first thing I was checking out when I got a new client was, what's this person's support network? Have they got capacity to take care of themselves? Okay, now I'll have these conversations with them. Do, do you see what I mean? And so it's I want to have conversations with people who've got the capacity to look after themselves 
And I think when that gets blurred, it gets messy because yeah, I, some people I, just I, love helping. I, I mean, I... I think that I am a little bit of a rescuer, but for whatever reason, I can just, I can kind of disconnect with, with their kind of stuff. He's cold. <laughs> He's cold. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Now. Okay. So on that, on that note, we did a podcast a few years ago. It, it, it's one of my proudest ones. And we, um, until today, but um, it was, it was one of our proudest ones, but um, we brought on a, uh, a, a grief uh, counselor, and and she talked about you know like there's it's impossible in this industry that that you know you're not gonna you're not gonna um have the grief conversation whether someone's spouse died whether their dog died whether whatever wh whatever that was um and she kind of gave us some skills about what that conversation could sound like and tony actually has a story that he can tell you about it yeah i mean it it, it, it was am amazing how that all came about we uh literally we did the podcast and then on a monday and later that week uh i had a client to come in and she lost her husband and she was just so so upset you know but after having that conversation that monday uh i learned so much and so i was able to put it in use on with her and i asked you know a couple of questions because usually uh, a lot of times when that happens, I'm like, oh, my condolences, and I'll try to move on, right? And uh, but uh, that particular time, uh, I, I remember the conversation that we had on, at the podcast, and so I, I started asking a few questions, and then the floodgates open. And what was so special about that is that she didn't have anybody to talk to. She's never so she, this whole time she uh, and this I guess her husband died about a week ago. Uh, and, and she was just holding it in and it was just killing her. And then by the end of that appointment, uh, she came, she gave me the biggest hug and said, thank you so much. There's such a relief. I was able to just open up. I'm, you know, I wasn't, she was just holding it all in. And sometimes we do have, and I wouldn't call that trauma dumping because I was in the position to, and, and I allowed it, you know what I mean? And, and it was just so sweet and so special and you know even to this day you could, our our relationship is is a little deeper as far as the client and and hairdresser relationship but but, but there's no we don't there's no trauma dumping but it's just like so special you know and she appreciates and and uh that that particular time i i think what's really interesting about what you're saying is because you'd had a bit of training and were prepared well, you felt prepared for that conversation and you may, which is really different, isn't it? I think it's so messy, this conversation, because I, I love your story. And then on the other hand, I think about someone who may be a hairdresser that was grieving themselves. And when someone comes in and tells them it's too much to bear, yeah, you know, I've been that hairdresser. Uh, and so I just think it's, I'm not really sure there's a brilliant answer <laughs> because I think sometimes we have capacity and sometimes we don't, but I'm not sure how we tell people that. Um, and I think it is to some degree educating clients around them being a little mindful about what they bring to their hairdresser. You know, it, it's so complicated. I think it's, it's a tough one to solve and have a, de a definite answer for, you know? Yeah, I you know I was I was I was thinking after I read the article, which I I love the article. Um, I was thinking about like sharing it like as an email with my clients and stuff. But then I didn't want them to feel like I'm pointing fingers at them either because that wasn't it at all. It was just it for me. It was just about awareness because, like I said, it doesn't really it doesn't affect me like that. So um, it was just an awareness thing. But then I chose not to do it because I'm like, ah, uh, this might not be taken the right way by everybody, you know. So. I, I, it's really interesting because I shared it on my social media, you know, and I've had some really interesting comments from hairdressers, some saying I feel this so strongly and some saying I've never felt like this. I love the conversations that I have. It goes both ways. Uh, and I just think that's, that's kind of the point, though, isn't it? We're all different. And to make a presumption that all hairdressers can cope or all hairdressers can't is foolish. There's yeah, nuance I, and it's gray. But yeah. how do we how do we educate the client then to to because it's 
I mean, or or the hairdresser. How how do we make the you know how do we educate everybody to to be able to handle or not handle the conversation? Yeah, the conversation. You know, if you don't have the capacity, how how do you get the tools to to avoid the conversation? <laughs> yeah, how do you say not today? Not today, <laughs> Kelly. Not today. Really, it's really hard, isn't it? And I, I think it's I think of it in a twofold way when I think about hairdressers. I think in in one way, this is a preemptive strike, though, and so it's not something that you can do in the moment. But for you know, using me as an example, when I came back into hairdressing after being a psychotherapist, um, the tone of conversations I was having with clients was really different than what I was having ten years previous. I'm talking about TV programs holidays, shoes, handbags, makeup, famous people, I'm chit-chatting, you know, uh, and I was keeping it more light. Uh, and it, and for, two, for two reasons, one, to save me, because I just didn't want to have those deep conversations. And because I do have the skills, though those, those could get deep quick, because I can't help it. <laughs> so in lots of ways, I was uh, pr protecting myself. But I also think there is something to be said. And, uh, you know, your client that you talked about, Tony, the one um, who just lost her husband, she could have had a really nice experience as well if you'd if she if she hadn't have told you and you'd have just give her an hour of fun. That's still a nice experience. It's different. Maybe it's not the one that she would have preferred, but it's still giving someone a break from their life <laughs> and having some fun in the hairdressers is valid. I That's where I go to the salon for now. I go for a chat and a gossip and a, and a giggle. And that's what I get with my hairdresser, you know? Um, so uh, the point being is, if what I did was... I, I made a deal that I wasn't going to have these conversations if I could help it. And what that, to blanket save myself. Sometimes I would have had the capacity and sometimes I didn't, but I worked on the basis that I didn't have that capacity because it's difficult to say, not today. Oh, okay, today. It's difficult to manage. And so to save myself the second time round, that's what I decided. And I, I almost even had prepared things so I could switch those conversations quite quick. And I really made an effort to keep it light. And it's so interesting. I coach hairdressers all the time who are burnt out and particularly hairdressers who work, let's say sort of on their own in a studio. These people are struggling more because people are more likely to open up when no one else is listening. And I, and I talk to them and I say, what do you talk to your clients about? And they say, oh, we have really you know, deep conversations about everything. And I said, do you think this is weighing a little heavy? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of the clients that I've spoken to who are burning out, some of the things we talk about is keeping it lighter so as to protect themselves. But a lot of these people are these ones who are very emp empathetic. They're, uh, they enjoy these conversations, but it can get really hard on top of a complex color correction. <laughs> you know, it can be tough. Yeah, like like you were saying, like it's hard to say uh, today and not today, but if you say okay today, then the next time not today, they they might feel that they're not getting the service that they they've received prior. Yeah, you know, so all of this because we we do have relationships with our clients, but it is different than a friend. We might have a friendly relationship with our clients, but there's a deal where we're providing a service, and I think it's gotten blurry that we provide a sounding board service as well. You know, we right, could but say, if you allow that, then then they're going to expect that, right? Because yes. it's part of the service now. Yeah. I love going to my hairdresser. I can, I go, I dump and I feel loads better. And I get some of my life. And so I think it's difficult. And so I think if you, if you are a hairdresser listening to this thinking, I'm finding it hard. I think you can just sort of, start to take some steps backwards to change the sorts of conversations you're having. And like I say, I talk to people about having prepared subjects in their head <laughs> so that you can come up with something new quickly or even start a conversation around something else so that it's uh, 
you, they're not opening the conversation maybe what what are some of the prepared stuff that you had as a hairdresser that you would like okay i can like shift into here oh i used to do like honestly when i was really burnt out and exhausted i used to do things like i would watch whatever the latest reality show was whether i liked it or not because it was pretty easy to have a conversation with most people about that you know it was a bit like the majority of my clients would probably be watching you know, Strictly Come Dancing, Love Island, The X Factor, you know, whatever they're called, <laughs> where you are, but you all know what I'm talking about. Um, I used to do things like watch really popular shows because chances are other people were watching it. I would talk about famous people, okay. you know, and if yeah. I had clients that were into fashion, we would talk about that. Some are really into makeup, skincare, you know, and I'd talk mm. about that, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but I would try and find common, I had clients I used to talk about gardening with. <laughs> um, I would try and find common ground that was light um, and, and run with that. Yeah, I, I, I can see that. You know, yeah. I do that a lot. I like, I'm a huge, uh, I love to cook and barbecue and stuff. So, you know, a lot of my conversations gear around that or, or, you know, family or uh, the podcast. So it's, uh, a lot of yeah. our are really interested in the podcast and, and the things that we're doing with the podcast. So, uh, Of course. I think one thing you can do as a hairdresser as well is if you share certain bits of yourself on your social media, like things you're interested in, you're going to attract clients who are also interested in that. They're like, oh, they do great balayage and they like cooking. And then they naturally talk to you about the cooking. If you're into traveling or your cats or your dogs or fishing or yoga, whatever, you know, this thing that people can connect with you around that. And then they'll talk to you about that. And I think that's another way of suggesting the sorts of things you might want to talk about. It can be really interesting and fulfilling still, but just doesn't maybe have to be quite as heavy. Mm, I like that. I have one client that... um. I hate when hairdressers do that. Let me talk about my one client. But anyways, we're going to talk about her anyway. <laughs> yeah, I have one client that like she's always dumping on her ex-husband, you know, to me, you know, and and I've I've just had to I've had to have the honest conversation with her like like dude, we've got to move this conversation on, you know, like like we can't we can't do this for, you know, the next 3 hours. Um, you know, of, of you dumping on your, it just doesn't like, where are we going with this? Right. Like if there's a yeah. solution, but I have no solution for your ex-husband, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And I, yeah. oh, well, I don't have any solution that you hate your ex-husband, you know, don't, don't, don't put that on me. So, yeah. um, but I've had to have, how uh, did she take that? Oh, uh, well, we have it every time she comes in. So, you know, she's, she's learning that she takes it for <laughs> three hours and then exactly she's like can i have 20 minutes can i just have 20 minutes Corey? so don't put him you know what I promise the, this is on. true this is true like like i do give her about 10 minutes and then i'm like okay you know what to back up a little bit like like even like i think this relates but like even when my wife and i are having a disagreement or having a quote-unquote fight we don't really fight anymore but but the second that that conversation becomes a full rotation now we're not talking about anything anymore Right. So now it's just time to end the conversation, you know, because, OK, we, we've talked about like my socks being on the floor or whatever that is. Right. Like if there's no solution to this, why, why are we continuing on the conversation except to make a point? So with with again, with with this one particular client, like once we get to like he's a jerk, that's not the word she uses, but he's a jerk. And then and then we get back to he's being a jerk. Then then I move the conversation on and go, go, let's talk about something else. You know, let's talk about how you hate your kids or something. I don't know. But but this conversation's kind of over, right? Otherwise, we're just like recirculating it. So you know, that's anyways, I don't know if that we went full circle <laughs> with that or not. But but that's it's hard. But I think having the skills to move conversations on kindly is a great skill because I bet when when you move the conversation on and she has more fun, she would leave the salon feeling better than if you'd allowed her to moan about him for three hours. Oh, completely. And and like, and like, she's very, she's from Boston. So she lives in this like Boston thing. So we can talk about, we can talk about Aerosmith every single time she comes in, you know, and then we just, you know, we'll sing Aerosmith songs or something like that. As a coach, you help hairdressers, uh, with the skill sets to, to be able to do that? Yeah, and, and it really varies from person to person because I just sort of sometimes suggest 
things they could do and then they maybe put it into their own words and you know stuff like that but I will help people find find the words that fit for them because there's you a know, lot of people that are passive or just meek or just you know they just they just love hair and and and, and then just accept it you know what I mean because there's there are clients yeah. that will just you know that yeah are a little aggressive when it comes to that and and so you know to help just and you know the hairdressers that they can't help themselves type, uh, you know, I don't want to say that, but uh, that'd be amazing to to give them the, the inner confidence and the strength to, to be able to say, Beep, put on the brakes. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's more about, as opposed to saying, let's stop talking about this. I would just try and be like, Oh, you went to a wedding. Tell me about that. <laughs> you know, just, you know, just, move it on in a nice way but I also think the other thing that we need to well this is what I'm all about really is helping hairdressers look after their energy in themselves so that on those days where this just happens it just happens that we're always saving a little bit of capacity for the what ifs and not basically walking around at 100 percent capacity all the time which is what i'm noticing a lot of hairdressers that come to me are operating in they book themselves silly they're they've got a lot of responsibility at home there's no room for error and then if someone comes in and dumps on them or something happens at school with their kids it's a crisis because there was no room left and so i'm always talking to people about let's try and operate around 80 90 and save something, save some magic. And so I think maybe one of the one of the solutions, I think there's lots of different ways we could help hairdressers and everyone needs to figure out which one works for them. I think that's it. I think it's really hard to have a, a blanket answer. Um, but I think some hairdressers might want to learn some skills to sort of have some compassionate statements and signpost and do that smoothly and kindly others need to learn about self-care and where their responsibility ends uh as a hairdresser um and some people really need to change the culture in their salons uh, you know and step it back a little bit and change the conversations and i don't know there's lots of different things isn't there <laughs> yeah. all right I, i'm gonna just shift the gear real quick because, you know, this is all about trying to prevent or, you know, how to handle uh, the clients dumping on us. But, you know, for a long time, we prided ourselves that we're therapists, that we, we, you know what I mean? We are slash hairdressers slash psychotherapists, you know what I mean? And we open up the door for the clients to be able to do this, too. Um, so how do how do. And I'm, and I'm not saying that all hairdressers are are, are opening. Say I'm a hairpath, hairpath. Yeah, nine nine's a tongue Herpath. twister. Yeah, but uh, but uh, we're sending mixed messages. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's so interesting. I I I got an email from one of my clients after she read the um article. And she, she wrote me a really long email saying all sorts of things. And she said something interesting, which was, I think people presume that all hairdressers are the same. They presume that we're all chatty. They presume that we're all this, we're all that. And I think that's some of the problem where there's like this stereotypical chatty, slightly dizzy hairdresser who, you know, all that kind of thing. And I think when people presume that we're all the same, that's a problem. And I think getting to know your hairdresser a little bit and really instead of just dominating the conversation, you know, like if you were making a new friend, <laughs> you wouldn't just blur onto people. Um, whereas sometimes I think because of that service, that sort of trade and that exchange of money, people feel they can do anything they want with that hour or four hours, you know, depends what's happening. But I, I suppose it's something about not presuming that we're all the same. Makes sense. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. The, the article brought up a, a good point too, is that, you know, our, our, for the, for 
just to speak generally is that you know we've gone from like 30 minute like haircuts to like four hour color corrections you know so now you have a lot more time and a lot more conversation to fill in that in the fill in that spot however you know to that point that if you're dumped on for four hours i mean even even still i mean i i guess that my boundary with with said client before like you know i i'm like i can't do this for four hours you know like i can't listen to you like dump on your family for four and and you know Look, I started off this conversation saying it doesn't affect me, and I'm gonna tell you how it affects me. How it, how it <laughs> me, right? But like, like I'm such a family guy, and that I have such honor with that, you know. Um, that that when people, when I guess when this one person, you know, starts jabbering about her family and how much dislike she has for her family, like I'm like, I, I don't, I can't comprehend it, and I don't understand it. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'm, I'm, I definitely have to move that conversation on, even if it, even if it's slightly rude about like, look, we're not, we, we can't do this anymore. I, I had a strategy like that because, you know, my personality is a little louder and a bit more cheeky. And, uh, you know, I was always trying to have humor with my clients. I would always try a, a cheeky sort of option, like what you're saying, which is as much as I'd love to hear about, you know, your husband for the next four hours. How about we talk about something else? I could probably get away with that as well. When I was behind the chair, that would certainly be my personality. And so I think a little bit of uh, slightly poking fun, you know, if it's okay in that relationship certainly works, but it won't work for everyone. <laughs> well, I mean, that's it too. I mean, we have to remember too that, you know, even though we're having these conversations that all of our clients are different too, right? Like there's certainly... Uh, 95% of my clients, I couldn't get away with that with, you know, oh, but at 95% of the, my clients, I could also probably make a joke, you know, somewhere like, eh, you know, yeah. whatever, you know, but, but this yeah. is the one client that I also know that if, that if you don't like stop her in her tracks, like it'll, it'll carry on. But, you know, that also took me years to kind of learn about her too, you know? So, um, yeah, her personality type and stuff like that. Like she needs to sometimes be like slapped upside the head in a, in, in a proverbial kind of way. Right. Like, like we're not going to talk about this, you know? Kind yeah, of and she sounds like she takes it on the chin as well. She probably quite likes it, you know. But I remember I had clients, and this is really when I was working from home. Um, so there was a period in career when I was working from home, and I remember people coming, sitting in my chair and going, oh, oh I've been waiting for this. And they didn't mean the hair. And <laughs> then they would just start. And, you know, I'd be literally trying to get a word in edgeways to say, what are we doing with your hair? Because I was like, I haven't got time. And 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 there'd be a monologue for about 20 minutes that I couldn't, I couldn't get in. And they were just offloading and telling me all their problems. And I just thought, oh, this is something's got to start. And I remember thinking, not even because it was stressing me. It wasn't stressing me out because it was too heavy. It was stressing me out because it was getting in the way of the job. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, and so, yeah. Here's a skill I'll give you. If they're going on for like 20 minutes, just sit in their lap. <laughs> They'll certainly stop talking. <laughs> oh, they would do if I sign their lap. <laughs> <laughs> That's but all. It just was, I, I needed to get, I, I remember what I, my strategy with this person the next time was, before you start, let's talk about your hair. Mm. <laughs> and then you can go. And they were like, oh, okay. And that's how I trained them. And then they just used to talk while I was weaving foils. Yeah. And, at, and, least and point, at least at that point, you're, you're setting the expectation that you're going to, you're going to monitor the conversation too. Right. Like even if that, because then from there you can go like, let's talk about your hair. And then, and then you're in the position to move the conversation where you want to, as opposed to dumping on, you know, as opposed to whatever. We whatever. can have this conversation part two, because it's, I mean, I mean, it, it, it can get deep. It can even get deeper. Oh yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? Um, There's so much to, to <laughs> unpack in the, in this whole conversation and uh, we're yeah. just scratching the surface. Yeah, definitely. It's really complex, I think, and it's really messy and there's not a simple answer, you know, because all clients are different, all hairdressers are different, our coping strategies are different, our backgrounds. And so I think really, you know, the main thing I want to say is, you know, we can't just make rules for hairdressers blanket statements it, everyone has to look after themselves and find their own way you know i think we're guilty of that not just with mental health but as an industry as a whole like we, we make these big statements you know about you know and then everyone whether social media like everyone has the same meme out about like 
you know, whatever it is, it doesn't matter, you know, pre-booking or whatever. Like we, we, we seem to like all, like, we do that as an industry. I think we're just, we're trying to figure stuff out. We do that as a society, you yeah, know? That's, that's, I that's, think, there. yeah, blanket statements are clickable though, aren't they? You know, it's more yeah. clickbait to make a blanket statement. Whereas I no, really just that. can't do that. It's, I, I just, it's, I don't think it's that helpful. I, I like the nuance you know but it's it's not as clickable <laughs> <laughs> exactly all right cool miss haley let people know how they can find you how they can get in touch with you how they can uh, chat you up well I, i'm mainly present on instagram although i did just join tiktok i'm down with the kids now um but the resilient hairdresser if you just google the resilient hairdresser i'll put that into instagram you'll find me Awesome. Miss Haley Jepson, thanks for hanging out with us. Thank you for giving us your insight. And thank you very, very much for joining us on your day off. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends, give us a rating and drop a review. To listen to all the latest podcasts, please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet. And to stay connected on and off the show, you can follow us at Hair Distry on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Peace and love.